If there really was a limitless style smart pill that could transform your brain to reach its full potential, what would you hope it would be like? For me, it would be something that could trigger amazing ideas and insight, because more than being able to do fast mental arithmetic or being able to reel off huge lists of facts, having great ideas is what can really change your life. And if you have a truly amazing idea, it could help you to become extraordinarily rich or to change the course of human understanding. True genius is not mastery of a subject, but the ability to totally shift the paradigm. In this post, I'll be breaking down moments of ideation the stories of great thinkers who had game-changing ideas. And from this we'll garner what was going on inside their brains, what perhaps stimulated those ideas, and what we can all do to nurture this skill. So why not start with Einstein's theories of special and general relativity, as these are two of the most influential ideas that we've seen in recent times. Special relativity was Einstein's first stab at this theory, and he reportedly came up with the idea while working in a patent office between 1905 and 1907. It's often been suggested that it was the repetitive busy work of ticking off patents, and perhaps exposure to all those unique ideas, that allowed his creative juices to flow. As the brain relaxes, so the pattern of brain activity becomes more dispersed. As neurons fire at different parts of the brain, novel connections can be formed, which in turn can provide new insights. They say that new ideas are simply combinations of older existing ideas. This is why you cannot force an idea, and it's why you'll often find the solutions to problems precisely when you take a break from that work. As a programmer, I'll regularly fix the issues I've been struggling over right when I take a toilet break. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin not by scrawling biochemical equations on a chalkboard fueled by caffeine, but by playing around and painting ballerinas with that bacteria. Many of us find our most creative ideas happen when we're in the shower or walking, and this is a state where we're just busy enough, just like that patent office, to keep our bodies busy while our minds can wander freely and activate the default mode network. So the default mode network is the areas of the brain associated with imagination and planning, which kick into gear when we have no other pressing tasks. This network is also sometimes referred to as the imagination network. So many people preach the importance of being in the now and living in the moment. In fact though, healthy daydreaming can be extremely useful, and it's one of the things that makes us uniquely human. This is why I always say there's no such thing as an unuseful brain state. It doesn't come up in conversation that often, so I don't always say it, but you know what I mean. One of the best ways to activate your default mode network is walking, and ideally walking in nature, which has the added benefit of providing relaxing and calming stimuli in the form of fauna, etc. Walking is actually responsible for many great ideas throughout history. Nikolai Tesla, for instance, came up with the idea of alternating current while taking a stroll with friends. He reportedly used his walking stick to illustrate the idea to them as they walked. Nietzsche once said that all truly great thoughts are conceived by walking. Steve Jobs was known for taking long walks, and countless writers from Jean-Jacques Rousseau to William Blake to Wordsworth all used walking to tap into the creativity. And it was similarly while letting his mind wander that Einstein had the happiest thought of his life, as he called it, when he imagined what someone would see when falling from a roof whilst holding an object. He realised that from the perspective of the individual falling, there would be no gravity because the object would fall at the same speed. But the other unique aspect of Einstein's Eureka moment and of the default mode network in general is visualisation. Einstein visually understood relativity by imagining that image before he put it into words. Now we have the luxury of being able to examine Einstein's brain, we know that it had some unique anomalies, a thicker bundle of neurons connecting the two hemispheres, called the corpus callosum, and larger inferior parietal lobes, which were involved in visualisation and spatial and mathematical reasoning. In short, visualisation is an extremely useful tool when it comes to ideation, and in many cases Einstein might have had an advantage in this area. Thanks to neuroplasticity, you can actually train your visualisation skills and potentially grow your own inferior parietal lobes. Playing 3D computer games can do this, as can practising visualisation with methods like image streaming, created by Win Wenger, which I made a video about and a post in the past. You'll find a link in the description below. Real-world visual cues are also often involved in Eureka moments, acting as kind of a catalyst. Whereas Einstein used visualisation, we all know the stories of Archimedes, who discovered displacement when getting into a bathtub, and of Isaac Newton, who understood gravity after seeing an apple fall to the ground, though these stories may have been embellished over time. Da Vinci observed how water would push a stick in a stream, and used this to understand the concept of lift for his flying machines. 
These cues help to provide a starting point, but by being able to visualize, we can manipulate objects and ideas in our minds and find new applications for them or gain new insight. This is further facilitated by entering that relaxed, imagination-rich state that allows free-form thinking. Going even further, many great ideas come from dreams. This is when our minds are allowed to explore completely bizarre and novel connections in an entirely unfettered manner, while exercising all of the senses and modalities together. Niels Bohr created his model of the atom based on a dream that showed him a positively charged nucleus with electrons orbiting like planets. And Dmitri Mendeleev created the periodic table after falling into a dream, listening to a musical symphony and seeing the elements flow together like the progressions of a musical sequence. These are just more extreme examples of people who have forgotten about a problem or a creative task, only to have their brain continue to work on it during a kind of incubation period. Stephen Johnson calls this the slow hunch and uses Darwin as an example. Darwin's notes show that he had the germination of his big idea long before the final epiphany. The eureka moment is simply when it all clicked into place. Indeed, this kind of unexpected insight is what led many throughout history to believe that truly great work was due to divine inspiration, the work of God or spirits known as demons or daemons. We can teach ourselves to remember more of our dreams by keeping a dream diary. But is coming up with genius really just a matter of relaxing, doing inane work and going to sleep? Notice that in many example scenarios, the seed of the idea were planted prior to the dream or the incubation period. That is to say that the individual was working on the problem before going to sleep. The idea may happen whilst they take the break, but they first need to prime their minds for the creative insight. In other words, strategically loading the brain with relevant topics and then taking a break could help your mind to work on that problem rather than thinking about your favorite TV show. Equally important is spending a significant amount of time researching and absorbing the topic. Take the story of Archimedes. While the Eureka moment may have happened in the bathtub or not, he had actually been working for Hiron, king of the Sicilian city Syracuse, to create the largest ship ever. Archimedes' challenge was understanding how such a large object could float. In other words, his discovery of the law of buoyancy was likely simply the happy end product of countless hours of relevant research, thought and study. Likewise, Einstein would not have discovered relativity had he never had exposure to mathematics or physics. Jules Henry Poincare discovered a unique property of fusion functions when randomly stepping into a bus during a geological expedition, but only after spending weeks attempting to better understand to no avail. He said, At the moment when I put my foot on the step, the idea came to me, without anything in my former thoughts seeming to have paved way for it. We can consider our brain's creative processes then as an input and output situation. The input is relevant information and inspiration, the output is a new idea. The more input you provide, the more unique combinations your brain will be able to give you back. Seeking inspiration and analogous ideas then can also help. For example, da Vinci would spend huge amounts of time studying the flights of birds in order to better inform his own flying contraptions. Another angle on this is that the best ideas happen in conversation. I've certainly elaborated on some of my best ideas whilst discussing them with friends or even just telling them about them. Likewise, we could note that Tesla was with friends when discussing alternating current. In his TED talk, Stephen Johnson describes the role of conversation in cultivating good ideas. Conversation in many ways acts like a wandering thought, naturally traveling from association to association while allowing input though from multiple individuals. This allows more completely novel combinations of concepts. Here a group of people become a kind of liquid network to use his lexicon or an exocortex. This is why the introduction of the coffee house is likely at least one catalyst for the introduction of many great ideas and possibly even the enlightenment as a whole. And finally, to kill the idea that creativity is simply a matter of switching off, we have the concept of active imagination. Described initially by psychologist Carl Jung, this is imagination with a purpose, where you actively use the same lateral thinking and free-flowing visualization to intentionally tackle a problem. This is something that can be achieved with time and practice. Cal Newport, author of Deep Work, recommends a similar strategy referred to as productive meditation. This is meditation where you simply think deeply on a given problem for a set amount of time. Completely unrestrained and undirected thinking will often result in pure nonsense. The random combinations of ideas need to be useful. In one study, it was found that the most successful creative thinking actually occurs when both the default mode network and the executive control network are in use simultaneously. The executive control network is the brain network responsible for controlling our attention, usually towards external stimuli. When you turn that attention inwards though, the result can be magnificent. The rub though is that normally activating the executive control network will automatically switch off the default mode network. 
So if there's a problem you're trying to solve, what can you do? Spend some time researching and learning about it. Speak with friends about it freely and openly. Don't dismiss any ideas as stupid. Research as much of it as you can. Then go for a long walk. When you get home, why not try some productive meditation? And finally, failing all else, let yourself fall into a deep sleep. I hope you found this video useful and interesting, guys. If you did, then please leave a like, please comment down below and share it around. I've got lots more cool stuff on the way, as always, on the brain, on the body, on working out, on self-improvement, online business. We're well on the way now to 100,000 subscribers. Thank you so much for that. And once we reach that milestone, that's when hopefully things will get really interesting. So yeah, thanks a ton for sticking with me and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.